All right, so there we go. We got the recording going. And uh, like I said, uh, we'll meet on Wednesdays uh, for the remainder of our class. And my hope is to by next week to be able to broadcast not from just my house, but be able to broadcast from the college um, uh, to give you a little history of this class. And, uh, and myself, um, you know, I, I taught this class for many uh, years in a conventional format, right, in person at the college for both our automotive program and our HORT program. Um, and it worked really well. Um, but then, as you know, with, with COVID, the whole college went to an online format. So last year, I felt like this was one of the few classes where we had enough different things we could do online with our Briggs and Stratton and still certifications um, that we could make the class work online. And I checked out some engines to students um, and I found that some students did really, really good. I had some students that they actually got Briggs and Stratton master certified in the course. And, and I hadn't had that happen for, for several years. It was really, really cool. Um, but other students struggled uh, and it made me want to go back to a traditional format. However, this year, the, and that's what I was planning to do, this, this year the, the college asked me, they said, hey, um, any class that you can do online, we really want you to do it online and only host the classes on campus that you're, um, you absolutely can't do online. And, and so they really, they, they've, they've started opening up, but they really pinched us down on what, what we could offer. Okay, but because my automotive program at the college is open, that means that it's more accessible to help you guys um, with stuff. So if you need an engine or a project or to check something out, or uh, if uh, throughout the course, maybe you're working on something and you just can't figure it out or you're having a technical issue or something, um, at least now this semester, uh, you know, I'll be able to help you. So my 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 plan is this: um, to to use our Wednesday mornings not only as our Zoom meeting time, but afterwards on a Wednesday, to be able to um, uh, set up appointments, so to speak, to meet with you guys one on one. If you need that extra help, if you have a question on something, if you um, let's say you you have a, a uh, a, a mower blade attachment that is just rusted on. You can't get it apart. Um, you know, we, you, we can drag it to the to the college and meet up with me on a Wednesday and may and, and get that thing apart. OK, so um, so I, I would say that even though this is an online class, it's a little bit more of what like the college would call a hybrid class where where if you need to come to campus to work on an activity or you're having a problem, we, you can set up an appointment with me and I'm going to try to use Wednesdays. I initially planned to use Wednesdays on, and Fridays, but they got the, the campus pretty closed up on Fridays. So it looks like Wednesday is going to be our ideal day and maybe we can sneak over there on some Mondays or something. So I wanted to make that announcement. This class is online, but I'm here to help you guys. Um, my goal is to, you know, get you guys feeling comfortable with small, small engine uh, maintenance and, and repair and, uh, you know, and I, I know you're going to end up at all different levels, but at least uh, at the very least, hopefully we can take away maybe some of the apprehension that some of you might have to working on uh, small engines and, and being afraid to, well, let me try to do something myself. Um, because if you've ever take, taken any of your um, outdoor power equipment or a motorcycle or you know, you, what you'll find is that most shops in our area are pretty backed up. Um, and so you're probably going to wait uh, several weeks to get that item repaired, whether it's a lawnmower or a chainsaw or your, you know, jet ski or something. Um, it's 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 going to take a while to get that repaired. And the other thing to take away from that is that all those businesses, uh, by and large, are looking for people like there's a there's a shortage of people to work on this type of stuff. And I will say that this stuff is different than, uh, you know, uh, typical car mechanic stuff. So what that means is that like I, a lot of my teachers at American River College that are, are master ASE certified car mechanics, even them, some of them struggle on small engine stuff because it's just different enough um, 
where uh, they get, you know, mixed up with different things and the ways uh, some of the engines work. And, and so anyways, it's, it's sometimes it's, it's complex through its simplicity, if you will. So anyways, our class this semester will be, uh, or this summer semester will be eight weeks long. We'll, we'll wrap up that first week of August and, and the goal is to, to hopefully not only how you learn about small engines, but feel more comfortable doing some maintenance and repair on your on your own engines or outdoor power equipment. Um, a little bit about me is that um, I've raced uh, motorcycles and goat carts for a whole bunch of years. And so that's really my my small engine connection. Um, these days I'm doing some some car racing and other things, but I've taught auto mechanics for uh 20 years now over 20 years now and um i uh you know have been working on uh small engines uh since i was about 10 years old so um anyways uh a lot of years doing stuff and a lot of years uh doing stuff wrong and making mistakes and and i will say that you know uh whenever you work on something and you and you make a mistake or you break apart you know it's a learning experience that's for sure so um you know, that, that's sometimes we, we got to take a couple steps backwards to keep moving forwards. And, and that's how stuff works. So I've broken a lot of stuff. I've learned a lot of stuff. And one thing I've realized is there's a lot more more to learn. And that's what I love about teaching is it forces me to get in here and learn more things as well with you guys. Um, so today, what we're going to do is we're going to cruise this canvas site a little bit and check it out and um, just make sure everything's working the way we want. What I found is, every, you know, since um, since spring of 2020, when I switched my classes uh, to online, I found that every online class is an absolute adventure, and you can have something working perfectly one way, one day, and it's not working the next day, and it's definitely a fluid thing. So, um, anyways, I have engaged this pink border going around the screen. And that is my student view to make my Canvas page look more like your guys's at home. Uh, of course, I'm running on a computer right now. Obviously, if you're looking at Canvas on, on a um, on a phone or a tablet, it's going to look a little different, right? Um, and I do recommend if you're able to uh, to get the Canvas app on perhaps your cell phone or something, because um, in this class to to prove that you've done certain things right we're going to ask you to uh, do some engine work and then you get into the challenge of well i got to take a picture or make a little video of uh you know and send it in through canvas to show that i did my assignment to di that i did my activity um and so normally most students including myself we're taking pictures with stuff on our phone um, so if you have the Canvas app, it actually makes it really easy to take a picture of your, your assignment and get it submitted into class. It's, it's pretty quick and painless. It doesn't take a whole lot of memory on your phone. And I'm the guy that's classic for always running like a cheaper, older phone. And uh, it even works on my stuff. So um, so that, that would be my, my recommendation for you guys. Um, uh, I'll have several announcements uh that come up through our course uh today we had a little reminder announcement um about class today and uh just what i've been working on as of late uh and that is the still website update um up until very recently that we used to have a website called stillvotech.com um and then still recently just updated this and, uh, and so I put a lot of you guys in this thing and then they updated it. And then heck, I, I can't even log into this thing myself. Um, and so I've called still and they said, oh yeah, you're in there. We got you all and we're importing stuff. And, and uh, anyways, uh, so we should have that going pretty quickly, but it's, ju it's just as, it, it, that's okay because the still uh, website stuff is kind of like a, a backup or a filler mix in to what we're doing on Briggs and Stratton. And so, you know, I really want to focus on the Briggs stuff first, but we'll get this still now I Academy, not still Votech. And I'll have to go back through the system now. This is what's difficult about online teaching. You think I got it all dialed in now. No, I'm going to have to go back through the system and change all the links and different things to I Academy, but um, we'll get that, uh, we'll get that handled. Um, 
essentially what the Still Eye Academy is and what the Briggs and Stratton Power Portal is, if I can get uh, get that thing up here, uh, is factory access to these manufacturer websites. Okay, so if you were a technician working at a small engine repair shop, let's say you're working at uh, Bliss Outdoor Power Equipment or Citrus Heights Mower, um, you know you would be on these websites every day. Uh, looking up service information or uh, updating your technician training. And so we're going to use them primarily for technician training. But what I did want to point out is that there's all kinds of stuff. There's parts lookups, engine repair manuals. And what Briggs has done is taken every single one of their manuals, even for old stuff. I'm going to type in single cylinder L head. And what you'll see is that, you know, going back to you know 1981 like here's the original manual it'll take it a minute here probably to load because it's a multiple page manual um but uh, they they have this stuff for you to download on on the site and so you guys now have access to that factory information Unlike the car business, though, where we have information databases such as All Data or Mitchell On Demand or ShopKey Pro, where you have one resource that has, you know, essentially all makes and models, right? Chevys and Fords and Toyotas and Hondas. Um, with small engine stuff, it's, it's like you got to go to each individual manufacturer. So unfortunately, I don't have access to every single manufacturer. I have access to Briggs and Stratton and still because those are the two manufacturers that have kind of stepped up to the plate and said, hey, we're going to support education and allow our uh, small engine mechanics teachers to to share this with their students and get them um, using the using our factory sites. So we don't have everything, but we have still and Briggs. And I will say that if you can use these, it, you know, if you worked at a, uh, you know, Yamaha motorcycle dealership, I mean, their stuff's going to be relatively similar. Uh, it's relatively similar to car stuff. Um, let me go back and I'll close this out and I'll go back here. Um, you know, so, so you, part of it is, is learning how to, how to look up information and so and so by having access to these two sites you'll be able to um hopefully uh, hopefully you get some oh there it goes single cylinder ohv they have vintage stuff i don't know why vintage didn't come up in my search um they might be calling it something different than vintage though. But even the really old engines are in here on the Briggs and Stratton site, which is which is pretty cool. Um, let's talk a little bit about the Briggs and Stratton certification since I have this site up. Okay. So first of all, you can see that there's all kinds of different tabs here along the top and you can kind of cruise through these. The power channel has a bunch of the videos and training. Um, Briggs and Stratton owns Ferris and Snapper and Simplicity, so you can see their different brands, if you will. Um, but if I go back to uh, the Power Channel and I go to Exams, what you can see here, and I'll make this a little bigger, what you can see here is that there's all kinds of different certifications that you can do, front office stuff to what they call their master service technician or MST. So you guys have the opportunity, if you're if you're crazy enough to wanna to do this, uh, to get Briggs and Stratton master certified. What does it take to do that? Well, you would have to pass um, all six of these exams. Now, I'm not gonna require you to do that, but I certainly would give you extra credit for doing that because I'll tell you, these exams are really, really tricky. They are difficult. Um, and over the years, I've only had, I don't know, maybe a dozen or so students uh, go through and get all of these. Um, 
and it's one of those things where uh, a funny, like when I first started teaching this class, I went to Briggs and Stratton school and I went to still school and I, I did all this training. And of course I've been an automotive uh, technician for 10, 15 years. And then I've been a teach, you know, so I do the training and I'm like, Hey, that was awesome. Yeah. MST. And, and I decide my very first class, I'm going to have all my students get MST certified. And, um, we we crashed and burned it, it just I, I you know the tests were pretty easy for me like well not pretty easy but they were fairly easy i thought oh these are doable no that's that wasn't the case uh so oh, you are not required to do these msts but i wanted to show you wh where they were at and what they what they are and i also wanted to note here um right here it says please add mst uh Vasco as your safe senders list. Um, so you guys that uh, are with us today, I want to say I saw all your names up on the site. So you got in here. But, uh, you know, when you first got signed up with Briggs of Stratton, you would think the email would come from Briggs of Stratton or it would come from the power portal. No, nope, it comes from this MST Vasco uh, is the sender. So anyways, uh, for for those of you in the class and you're like, I'm still trying to get signed up in to Briggs and Stratton, uh, make sure that you do this right here and add MST uh, BASCO.com to your safe senders list so that you can get those emails. And just be kind of looking for that so that you can get your account set up. Because you, like I said, you know, common sense says that you would receive an email from Briggs and Stratton or from the Power Portal or something like that. And so you might not have been looking for this. Of course, that's if I, I set up your emails correctly and, you know, I know I missed a few of you guys. So anyways, um, there's the MST. So what, but you're not required to do that. What are you required to do? Well, you are required to go in here where it says technical CTE basic. Okay. We're starting with the basics. My first semester, I thought, hey, we're all doing MST. It was an epic failure and I, I had to throttle it back and go, okay, let's just do the basics. And so the test that we are gonna do, and I'll get my uh, drawing tool up here, is we're gonna go through these tests and these will kind of line up with what we're doing in the class. So we're gonna go um, uh, through this four cycle theory. This is our first one. I wanna say this is our second one. Um, Governors and fuel systems are, are kind of like three, four. It's almost like these two really go together. So I'm gonna draw a line connecting those two. And then we end up finishing with this one. And this one, I don't have you guys do because it's really valuable if you're looking up parts at a Briggs & Stratton dealer. But I found that most of most of my students, you know, that a lot of them were, were taking this as part of their certificate and it just wasn't, they weren't getting a lot out of that one. However, I will say, you know what? This one can be used for a little bit of extra credit and there'll be a, uh, uh, a class announcement coming up on that. So I'll, I'll have different things in here that are set up for extra credit because all this stuff is good and you will learn from it all. But these five I found are the most pertinent to what we're doing in our class. And so it's from these five exams, if I highlight this in a different color here, it's from these five areas that I built up our Canvas page. And even when we were teaching this class, just straight up in person, you know, this is how we would do this. In fact, uh, initially uh, we were doing this as like a five week class in person where you met four days a week, but the whole class is five and a half weeks long or so. Um, and so uh, if I go back to uh, Canvas now, and we'll clear those drawings, and we'll go to our class modules. I'm gonna zoom in on that. Um, you can see that we have a module that one, engine operation and theory, it really lines up well with that first Briggs certification test, right? Then we got our module two, engine compression, diagnosis and repair. It lines up with that second certification area. 
module three, we did our fuel systems and carburetors. Then we got our module four, our governors. And then finally our module five, which is our ignition systems. And I added in some electrical stuff as well. Then I put in some bonus stuff in there for you guys. Uh, for example, racing and high performance small engines in case some of you guys are interested in that. And I will say that, um, you know, that's, you guys can tell uh, probably from my, you know, some of my postings and my, my home screen picture here that, you know, I'm, I'm into it, man. I've, I've been into uh, trying to make stuff go fast or go fast in various things uh, my whole life, just about. Um, and I wouldn't say I'm really all that fast, but I like, you know, trying to get faster. Um, but this is another area that I think a lot of people don't think about it. So uh, one announcement I wanted to make for you guys, um, and I would encourage you if you're interested is to email me about it, is uh, in, our, uh, in our racing community, sorry, not, not a good multitasker, there we go. In our racing community, we're actually looking for some tech people, okay? So here is one of my favorite goat kart tracks around. It's the Blue Max Kart Club. It's in Davis. And uh, these guys are looking for uh, some folks just like yourselves to maybe get involved and uh, learn how to be a tech official. Okay, because we have all these carters racing around the track. And what we try to do is to keep their engines legal, right? Racy, racers being racers, everybody's looking to uh, find that advantage, I'll say, right? And sometimes that will encourage racers to break the rules. And so what we try to do is have a good tech program to uh, make sure that people are, are staying within the rules. And so it might be checking carburetor slides. It could be uh, testing uh, compression or uh, compression ratios by measuring the, the volumes, the CCs of the engine. It, it could be doing any number of things. Um, uh, on on the engines and uh, so if, if you're into this stuff you can actually uh, once you get some skills and you kind of learn what to do you can get paid to be a tech inspector and there's goat kart tracks all over our our northern California area it's and it's a lot of fun so if that's something that's interests you uh, reach out to me because we're, we're trying to put together a program where maybe we get some of you folks out to the track and get you trained on doing tech stuff um, so there, you know, that's just another part and you can see that the racing, there's a lot of carts out there, the racing's fierce, right? So, um, it's, uh, it's no joke. It's, it's, a, it's a heck of a lot of fun and, uh, we have a good team out there. And one of the things that's super important is to try to keep everybody legal within the rules. So, um, you know, that way the, the guy or girl that, you know, has a, a 2000 dollar goat cart uh, can can compete toe to toe with the person that's got a $10,000 goat cart if they're driving well within the rules and, and all that stuff. So um, anyways, there is a, there is a need for for that stuff. Let me go back to our let me go back to our canvas uh, page here. Um, and we'll go back to modules. So that's why I included some of that racing information and Briggs and Stratton is actually really strong in the in the cart racing community. They have a great engine package uh, called the Animal 206 and they also have a World Formula package um, that are just, are just really good. They're very techable. So we got some stuff there for you. Um, I have some extra credit stuff here for you as well. Um, and so, so that's how I built the class. It really, follows along with what's on oh that's right i get that locked up right now it really follows along with um the briggs and stratton uh certification areas okay um and then we we add some stuff to that one thing about briggs and stratton as i open up this um i'm gonna click this thing it says four cycle theory And it's opening that that test. Um, one thing about uh, Briggs and Stratton is they are primarily a four-stroke cycle engine manufacturer. They don't make two-stroke engines. Now you might be thinking, like, I, I don't know what the difference is, right? Well, we're we're going to get into that, but 
um, Briggs and Stratton doesn't make a lot of two cycle engines, however, still does. And so the reason we have the still kind of worked in there is that they still build two stroke engines. And so that way you can get some knowledge and experience of each different type of engine, okay? And so I've mixed in some of the still certifications with our, with our class. And uh, with these websites, uh, like the still being messed up, um, what I will do is I'll, I'll go in and we'll, we might have to adjust some, some due dates on stuff because I want to give you guys plenty of, of time to get these activities done. But just the basic concept of the class is we, we rely on the Briggs and Stratton for the four cycle information and the still for the two cycle information, if, if, if you will. Okay. Now, speaking about four cycle and two cycle, you're probably wondering, well, like, what's, what's the deal with that stuff? Four cycle, two cycle, maybe you're not sure what I'm talking about. Well, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch my uh, presentation screen to um, a PowerPoint. And we're going to talk a little bit about it. Okay, so we're going to talk about air cooled versus water cooled, L head versus OHV, four cycle theory. We're going to go over this stuff. Okay. So first of all, one of the big difference between an engine for an outdoor power piece of equipment versus your car, for that matter, is largely going to be like how is the engine cooled. This is another way for you to classify an engine by what type of cooling system it has. Um, so we can put engines in different classifications or different groups, if you will. And we can do that all kinds of different ways. And um, uh, one of the ways is what, by, what, what type of cooling system does it have? So most of your outdoor power equipment engines are air-cooled. And the advantage of making those engines uh, air-cooled is that, um, well, they have, oops, let's go back here. Let's see if I can get my drawing tool going again. Um, it, co it costs less money, okay? But there's less parts. There's a lot less parts here. And so the reason why that's good is it makes the engine more compact, it makes it lighter. And yes, of course, it does help save us some money on building the engine, which helps you and me save some money when we're buying the engine, right? Um, so it makes the engine simpler. It has less parts. It costs less money. It needs less room on there to, to put the engine on a piece of equipment or in a motorcycle chassis or a go-kart or whatever. Um, but the downside is going to be higher operating temperatures. And it's probably not going to last as long as something that's liquid cool. Because what we're relying on is the outside air to come in here. And this is where the air comes in on these engines, that little screen on the top. There's a fan up here built into the flywheel. So the air comes in and then it blows over the engine and it warms up and kind of blows out these plastic covers on the bottom. Okay. So that's how that, that engine is cooled. And of course, as the outside air gets warmer, right? Because we're just relying on that air, the, the engine is gonna run hotter. Um, a water-cooled engine has coolant flowing in a radiator right here, and it can maintain the, the temperature of that coolant much better. It's likely gonna have an extra fan. So it's using air still moving over the radiator to remove heat from the coolant, but it just has a lot of extra cooling ca uh, capacity or capability, if you will, than an air-cooled engine, meaning that it's not going to be affected by changes in ambient temperature as much. It is still affected, right? Like your car is a lot more likely to overheat in the summer than it is in the winter, um, but it has more cooling capability, okay? But it's a more complicated system. You have to have a water pump, a thermostat, a radiator, hoses, right? All the plumbing involved to make that happen. Um, and it makes the engine heavier and more costly. Okay, so one of the big differences you'll see 
is how the engines are cooled. Most of our outdoor power equipment stuff is going to be air cooled. Okay. So moving right along. Uh, so he, another way we can classify our outdoor power equipment engines is which way does the crankshaft go? That's in the center of your engine. That's the part that's spinning around. Um, and uh, the end of the crankshaft on a small engine, specifically one that's built for outdoor power equipment use, uh, we're gonna call it the PTO or power takeoff. That stands for power takeoff, okay? So on a horizontal engine, this PTO is coming out on the back side here. This cover here, this is where the air comes in to cool off that engine. There's a fan on the flywheel right there. So air is coming in there. And then there's a shaft coming out of the back of the engine that spins. That's the PTO shaft, which is essentially at the end of your crankshaft. Okay. So if I was going to build a goat cart, whether it's a, what I'll call a fun cart that you might, you know, drive around in your backyard, or I'm going to put it on some type of mini bike chassis, or, um, you know, I would use a horizontally uh, set up uh, horizontal crank configuration where the engine mounts on this flat platform and the crankshaft is, hor you know, horizontally uh, oriented so that I can, you know, put a gear on here, I can have it go to a chain and, and go to my rear axle or whatever, okay? In outdoor pow power equipment world, these engines are usually running things like generators, pumps, log sp splitters, tillers, that type of stuff. Um, by comparison, this engine has a vertical crankshaft. And so what I've had my students do over and over and over again is they want to build a goat cart or something and they have a lawnmower engine. And it's like, yeah, that's not going to really work, okay? These engines, you're usually going to find on lawnmowers, both riding lawnmowers and push behind mowers and stuff. Um, and the crankshaft on these guys, well, that crankshaft is going up and down. So it's poking out the bottom of both these engines. Um, you can't see it from the angle of this picture, but again, air comes into the top, right? You see that fan? That's why if you're, if you're mowing your lawn and there's a bunch of uh, grass and debris stuck to the top of your motor, sh shut your engine off and wipe all that grass off of there or blow it off or, or brush it off or whatever. Keep these vents up here clean. That will help keep your engine cooler, which is gonna help it last longer, okay? Every class period you, you're with me, I always like to share multiple tech tips. So there's your very first tech tip. Keep the air inlets clear on your outdoor power equipment, okay? Um, second tech, tech, tap, tech tip, let's try that again. Second tech tip is to uh, don't try to use a vertical crankshaft mower for a goat cart, right? So, so the crankshaft's going up and down. You would need to flip this engine on its side to try to adapt it to a goat cart or a mini bike, and it's not going to work. Its lubrication system on the inside is built for it to be set up in this orientation like you see on the screen. And what would happen is you will burn up the motor uh, trying to run it sideways. So this engine's going to go on a mower deck like this. Here's my handle. Here's my wheels. I know that looks pretty bad, but that's how it's made to run. Don't, you don't try to throw a, a motor like this on its side. You'll burn it up within a matter of minutes. Um, so different configurations of the crankshaft, horizontal or vertical. Okay, vertical is what you typically see on your mower engines, right? Because on a mower, what's going to go down here? Well, the mower blade goes down here, right? And so that blade's spinning around and I push my mower and now I'm cutting the grass. All right. So we'll clear out those terrible drawings and keep, keep going forward. So another way I can classify an engine, guys, is... Um, by what is the arrangement of the valves and the cylinder head. And so I, I want to do a little bit of name, name those parts type of thing here on this. Now we do have some parts already labeled on this picture, right? Like we say, we have, okay, that's the piston. 
right there and and uh, it, you know it moves up and down through a stroke and it's got this area here but what we don't have is a lot of other things properly labeled like down here we have the crankshaft and I'll draw some arrows here Okay, so we got some stuff labeled, but I got to draw some arrows for you guys so you know where stuff has, is at. So um, so these guys that open and close here, these are the valves, and I have an intake valve and an exhaust valve because I got to get fuel and air in the engine. When I burn it, I got to get the exhaust smoke, right? The, the smog, I got to get that out of the engine, right? So I do that with the action of my valves. Those are my gatekeepers to get stuff in and out of the engine. The valves are actuated by the camshaft right here. The heart or center of my engine is my crankshaft right here. And this is uh, this is what's all about. Like this is the part I'm spinning around that I get power applied to. This is my PTO shaft. This is, this is what is gonna drive me down the road if it's in my car or it's gonna cut my grass if it's in my lawnmower. That's the heart of my engine. That's what I'm trying to spin is that crankshaft. Yeah, we have a piston that goes up and down. Uh, I didn't label this one. I'm going to say there's a connecting rod that connects the piston to the crankshaft. Um, it moves up and down through a hole in the engine block. We call that hole the bore of the, the cylinder bore of the engine. And that distance that it moves up and down is called the stroke. Okay, The top of the engine is called the cylinder head. Well, one way to classify this engine is to talk about, well, what's the shape of the cylinder head and what's the arrangement of the valves? Well, these valves are to the side of the cylinder head. And so if I drew this a different way, I would say, okay, well, here's my valve. Here's my cylinder bore with my piston and it. It kind of forms like an L. So I'll change my color here. It kind of forms like an L like this. And so they call this an L head engine. Okay. Now, if you've ever heard of like, if, if maybe you, you, you're into old cars or something, um, you know, hear, hear about the classic, like the flathead Fords of the, you know, 1950s and, and stuff, um, uh, 40s and 50s, the flathead Fords, uh, those were an L head engine. Okay. So um, what's the deal with this? Well, its valves are next to the cylinder and that makes it cheaper to build. It also makes it not as tall, um, but you know what? It has lower compression ratios and it's not as efficient. It generally is not as clean. So I'm gonna say, you know, for emissions, for smog, isn't a great design, but it is nice and simple. Um, so you, we saw it for years used on things like lawnmowers and a variety of small engines. Um, but this design is really being phased out. Okay. So, um, you know, one thing that, um, well, you, there's lots of pictures I have for, of these parts labeled in our class as you go through stuff. Um, but one of the things you might want to do if you're ever like on classes is, you know, use your snipping tool. If you're on your phone, use a, use, you know, do a screen capture. Um, so part of working on engines or working on anything really for that matter is like knowing what the parts are, right? Like, what is this part? What is it supposed to do? Okay. In fact, tech tip number three today is basic diagnostics. I always ask myself two questions. I'll put this in red. what is this thing supposed to do? Is it doing it, right? So uh, maybe I have an engine that doesn't start and I look at the spark plug and I go, well, what's that spark plug supposed to do? Oh, that spark plug's supposed to provide spark in the cylinder at the right time. Well, is it providing that spark, right? If it's not, hey, that engine's not gonna run. 
So, uh, I mean, sometimes it's really easy to find yourself totally upside down trying to do some diagnostics. If you keep things as simple as possible, that will usually help you figure stuff out that's actually pretty complicated. So um, L-head engine design, an older engine, I'm going to clear my drawings and I'm going to go back a slide here. The reason I want to do that is I have two engines here. The red one here is an L head. Okay. I'll just put L head. It's supposed to be HD. Uh, this, as you can see right here, this is overhead valve. So the L head design is smaller. It's cheaper to build. You know, it's arguably, you know, pretty good, pretty reliable, but it's not as efficient. It doesn't run as clean. This engine, though, it's, you can see it's made the engine a little bigger. It's definitely more complicated, but it's going to be more powerful, more efficient, and it's going to run cleaner. Okay. So overhead valve versus L head. Let me clear these drawings here. So L head versus overhead valve. So what's the overhead valve? Well, over, over, overhead valve or OHV is now we take, instead of having the valves down here in the engine block and a flat cylinder head, now we're putting the valves up in the cylinder head and the motion at from the camshaft has to be redirected from down here. It's got to turn 180 degrees and go that direction. It makes the engine more efficient. It makes it a better air pump. It runs cleaner, makes more power, but it does make the engine have to have more parts makes it more complex and it makes it taller too. Like, look at, here is the top of the engine block right here. And I got several inches of stuff up there. Here's the top of the engine block right here. I got maybe one, two inches, right? The thing that sticks up the most is the spark plug. Look at how much taller that is on the overhead valve, right? So higher compression ratio, more power, you know, it runs cool. Like everything about it's better, but it's going to be more expensive. It's going to be more complicated to build, you know, maybe arguably a little more complicated to work on as well. Um, so OHV stands for overhead valve. All right, let's clear those drawings. Now, one of the things you have to do with every, every engine for that matter is you have to, um, be able to identify what it is, okay? And uh, if we don't get into this today, which I don't think we will, we'll talk about it next class. But that is identifying these engine numbers. In the Briggs and Stratton world, they call it model type and code. But if you relate this to like a car, right? Like every car produced for a long, long time has a VIN number, vehicle identification number. And you use that to, to figure out what is this car, what engine is in it, what parts is it supposed to have, what year was it produced? It's the same thing. So any engine that you happen to be working on, one of the things you, you got to do is you got to identify what is it, right? What year was it built? What model is it? You know, how big is the uh, internal size or the displacement of the engine? And uh, on older engines, this is typically stamped in the metal. On uh, newer engines, uh, they'll not only stamp it in the metal somewhere, but they'll usually have a barcode sticker somewhere. But you know, the problem with these stickers is, you know, they get hit with you know cleaners and other things, and they fade, and so the sticker might be gone. But the, if you if you look hard enough, you should find the metal stampings to help you identify what the engine is. Okay, and even a car engine is going to have a serial number on that engine that with enough research, you can backtrack and figure out what that engine is, what year was it built, what, you know, what's its size supposed to be, that type of thing. All right. Okay, so we're going to spend a few minutes here on four cycle theory. Now, four cycle means the same thing as four stroke. Sometimes it's called four stroke cycle. Okay. Other times you might hear it called the auto cycle 
after the guy that came up with this way back in the 1800s, Nicholas Otto. Okay. Um, but the four stroke cycle engine is, is really the, the mainstay. It's like, you know, unless you're driving an electric car, you have a four stroke cycle engine in your car. Okay. The only company I can think of that even put two stroke cycle engines in their cars was, was Saab. And that was like back in the 1950s. Um, Mazda spent a long time playing around with rotary engines, which are, which are awesome. Um, but by and large, everybody's going to have a four stroke cycle engine in their car. And if you look at other engine designs, other engine cycles, they all still have to do the stuff that this four stroke cycle engine has to do. Okay. So let's, let's jump into this thing. Boom. All right. So we'll clear out my drawing. All right. So we're going to start with the intake stroke. And on the intake stroke, what happens is a couple of things here. Okay. And I need to label some stuff here. I need to label some stuff just to get us feeling comfortable with everything. So when the piston's all the way at the top of its stroke, and then all the way at the bottom of the stroke, those are called two different things, okay? Um, I also want to label what this guy is. All right. So let's get our text tool up here and get some labels going on. So this is going to be TDC for top dead center. When it's at the bottom of the stroke, it's called BDC, bottom dead center. And over here, what we have is the intake valve. In blue, the exhaust valve is in red. So what happens is we start the intake stroke. We start this cycle at TDC, okay? So it's starting at the top and this engine starts to move down, move the piston down on the intake stroke. While it's doing that, the intake valve opens up, as you can see in the, in the picture here, and that allows fresh air and fuel mixture to enter the engine through the intake valve, okay? So we're going from TDC uh, to, to BDC on that intake stroke because it starts at the top, it's moving down, it starts drawing in fresh air fuel mixture that later on we're gonna burn it and get some power out of it. So then we go to our next stroke in the cycle and now we start moving the other way. Okay, so I'm not gonna clear all these drawings. I'm gonna get my eraser up and I'm just gonna erase a few things here because TDC BDC is still important but now what you'll see is now the engines go in the other direction so now we're going up from bottom dead center to top dead center and the other thing you're going to notice is that both the exhaust valve and the intake valves they're both closed and what we're doing is we're compressing or we're squeezing the air fuel mixture into a tighter and tighter spot. What is this going to do? It's going to heat things up. So we're doing this to get the air fuel mixture properly mixed up together. We're doing this to add heat to it so it gets ready to ignite. Okay. So we go intake, compression. Now we are going to go to power. So we'll do a little bit of a racing. So what happens here is now intake and exhaust valves, they're still closed. But now our spark plug is going to light off a little bright blue spark. And that's going to give us the last little bit of heat that we need to start to burn 
the air fuel mixture in the engine. So we start to burn that air fuel mixture in the engine and it makes a, a ton of heat and a ton of pressure in here. And that heat and pressure is what forces the piston down. And remember, because the piston is connected to the crankshaft by its connecting rod, what this is doing is it's rotating the crankshaft down. I can't stress enough, like this is what it's all about, guys. It's all about getting this one stroke out of this cycle. It's the power stroke. The power stroke is what's actually moving us down the road. The power stroke is what's, you know, allowing your chainsaw to cut through those tree limbs or to, you know, allow your motorcycle to climb that hill. Like that's what it's all about. So we're burning the air fuel mixture on the inside of the engine. By the way, this is why we call this type of engine, it's an internal, internal combustion engine, okay? Because that burn is happening on the inside. So we get that burn happening, that combustion process, it makes a lot of heat and a lot of pressure and it forces the piston down. Uh, and that's how we get power out of this thing, okay? Um, now, is this super efficient? No, in fact, what we traditionally would say is that this is about one third efficient or 33% because a lot of the heat energy is ultimately gonna just go right out the exhaust. Other heat energy is gonna be absorbed by our cooling system so we don't melt our engine down and then the other third is actually what's pushing the piston down on the power stroke. All right. Um, we will do some erasing one more time here. And now we're going to go to the last part of our cycle, which is the exhaust stroke. So on exhaust stroke, now we've burned the air fuel mixture and we've burned it, you know, mostly all the way up, right? So now the piston's gonna, because the action of the crankshaft moving around, it starts pushing the piston back up. About this time, the exhaust valve is now opening and that's letting these hot exhaust gases flow out of the engine. Why do we need to do that? Because we got to get that stuff out of there so we can bring fresh air fuel mixture in the engine and start this process all over again. Um, and that's what it takes to, to run this engine. It's, intake compression power exhaust right intake compression power exhaust intake compression power exhaust and it's doing that over and over and over and over again now i don't know how well you guys have been paying attention to this but if you look at this and you counted the how many times the crankshaft went around what you would have noticed is the crankshaft Crankshaft rotates two times or 720 degrees in one four stroke cycle. Okay, so 720 degrees of rotation in one four stroke cycle. If, if you've driven your car and on your car, there's a gauge called your tachometer and it shows you your RPM of the engine that's revolutions per minute of the crankshaft. So that's good and all, but what's that mean? Well, if um, let's say my, my engine is running at, I don't know, let's say it's running at 3000 RPM. Well, what that means is I have 1500 uh, four stroke cycles per minute happening because it takes two revolutions of that crankshaft to make one four stroke cycle. Okay, but there's a lot of stuff going on in there, uh, you know, pretty quickly at even 3000 RPM, which is a pretty modest RPM level. Okay. Uh, and most of your small engine stuff, like a lawnmower engine, that type of thing is somewhere around 3000 RPM is usually going to be the meat of its power range. Um, but there's engines in other applications that go up to much higher speeds. 
Okay. You know, for example, a, a Formula One race car engine, those things go up to 18,000 RPM. If you have even a, a sport bike motor, right, out of a Ninja or a GSXR, I mean, that might be 12, 13,000 RPM. I mean, so there's, there's a lot of parts moving in there at a really high rate of speed. But if that engine's running, <clears throat> this cycle is happening. We got to bring the air fuel mixture into the engine. We got to squeeze it to get it nice and hot and ready to ignite. Then we ignite it and get power out of it. That's our power stroke. That's what it's all about. Then we got to get those exhaust gases out of there so we can start the process all over again. Every single engine cycle design, whether it's a two stroke cycle, whether it's a diesel engine, whether it's an, um, an Atkinson cycle engine like you might have on a Toyota Prius or even a rotary engine has to do these things. It has to bring in the air fuel mixture, has to squeeze it. Then we get to burn it and get some power out of it. And then we got to push it out um, so we can start that process again, okay? So intake, compression, power, exhaust, that's our four stroke cycle. Now, in order to do that, we not only needed a piston and a cylinder bore and, and spark plug and stuff, but the big things namely here are gonna be that we had to have valves. We had to have this intake valve and exhaust valve. We had to have valve springs. We had to have this camshaft that operated those valves. So they opened and closed at the right time, okay? Well, when we get to our other engine designs such as two stroke engines or even rotary engines, they, don't, they can do this job without valves. So it makes those engines simpler. So why does still, who makes a lot of chainsaw engines and stuff, why do they still build two strokes? Because a two stroke engine is not gonna have valves. It's not gonna have a camshaft. And that means it's gonna be lighter. It means it's gonna have less parts moving around on the inside. So it can go to higher RPMs, revolutions per minute. And in some, in, in, in therefore, it can re, re, uh, achieve higher levels of performance in some regards. So, anyways, um, you know, this cycle is the basis of our understanding of how engines work, though, okay? Because it does everything we need it to do, and it does it each thing in its own dedicated phase or part of the cycle, right? Intake, compression, power, exhaust. All right. Um, so with that, we will now clear those drawings because it was getting pretty messy. Intake, compression, power, exhaust. But you know what's different about this engine is on these pictures, I have an overhead valve configuration. So what you can see, hopefully, just, just by the image is that this engine is going to flow a lot better. Intake compression, power, and exhaust. So the big advantage of going overhead valve, right? Because this is an OHV engine on the, on the screen here. The big advantage with OHV is it's gonna have better flow. And when I have better flow, uh, that means I'm gonna have better performance and better efficiency. All right. So hopefully you're feeling better about that four-stroke engine design. Now here we're, we're again looking back at that um, Briggs and Stratton L-head design. Um, you know that's still a four-stroke cycle engine, so it goes through those 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 four cycles: intake, compression, power, exhaust. Uh, what I want to do now, because um, we've been talking for quite a while, and I you know you're you're probably getting a little bit um, burned out. I find that. You know, I can only do Zoom for so long before I, I can't learn anymore, right? I just, I get Zoomed out, if you will. So we're going to start wrapping things up today, um, but we will go back to our certification. Um, and some of the stuff we answered in our lecture today, uh, and maybe some stuff we didn't, right? So, so let's see, um, like, now we know what RPM is. Uh, now we know which stroke follows the exhaust stroke. Oh, the intake stroke would, would come after that one. Um, but we don't know, well, what's the purpose of the carburetor? Well, 
it actually mixes the fuel with the air that's coming in the engine. Um, so let me let me just take this test real quick. I'm just going to throw down some some answers. The stroke of an engine is a linear distance piston travels from TDC to BDC. We actually answered that today, right? That's true. Which of the following has the greatest effect on the operating temperature of an air cooled engine? Oh man, this this is uh, this is a tough one because um, all of these things have a pretty um, big effect on the um, pretty big effect on the temperature of the engine. Like I put the wrong spark plug heat range in there. That's a big deal. Um, you know, if I can't get the exhaust out, that's a big deal. You know, what I like the answer, one of the answers to be is, is there anything blocking the fan? To me, that, that would be the biggest thing. Uh, out of this, I'm going to put down the exhaust back pressure, but you know, I'm not a hundred percent sure. This is a new test question. And so I'll show you in a minute, how do you find the actual like answers according to Briggs and Stratton? Okay. Uh, oil viscosity, um, I'm just going to go through here. In fact, I'm just going to um, start answering random stuff. Okay. Uh, answering everything. A, so you can see how it, how it goes. Um, I can't answer that one, A, because that's wrong. Uh, proper eye speed. Uh, it, all right. So I answered, I guessed on some. I answered some correctly. We'll submit our test and see what we got here. Oh, verify your database. Wow. I've never had that issue come up. Maybe because I had the things open so long. All right, and you can see now I get some different questions. I'm just going to, oh, let's talk about this. Valve overlap is, I'm going intake compression power exhaust. As I'm finishing up the exhaust stroke, I'm starting the intake stroke and I get a point in time where both the intake valve is opening a little bit and the exhaust valve is closing a little bit. And at one point in time, both these valves are just open a little bit. We call this valve overlap. Um, anyways, so I'll, I'll answer that one correctly. Um, I'll answer that one correctly. How often does a four-stroke engine make power to turn the crankshaft? Uh, once every two revolutions, boom. Uh, the rest of these we're just gonna guess on here. We're just gonna answer a bunch of A's and see what happens. I can't do this one. Crankshaft, uh, 720, okay. Okay, so what happens here is uh, we actually did we were pretty close to passing that test and I guessed on more than half the answers, right? Um, so uh, what happens is it tells you that, hey, you didn't, you didn't make it. To get credit in our class, you, you wanna pass the test. So you gotta get 75%, but maybe you're doing a test later on this semester, like the governor's one is one that people really tend to struggle with. And you're just having a really hard time. You're not getting it. Submit whatever score you, you have. Take a screenshot of this, submit it, and say, okay, look, I've been working on this. I haven't got over 60%. Um, and at least I know you, you've been trying to do it. And then later on, if you keep taking it and you get a better score, I'll give you extra points when you get that, that better score turned in, okay? It doesn't tell you exactly what you missed. It says, hey, you missed four questions on four cycle theory. Well, yeah, I knew that. There was 10 questions and I got 60%. So obviously I missed four of them. So Briggs does not tell you exactly what you missed. What I would do is when I take the test questions, I would, you know, make little notes as to what ones I'm not sure about, which ones I don't feel good about, take some screenshots of what I'm doing um, so that I can use that to help me kind of analyze stuff. Now I promised you, I would show you like, where do you go? Um, where, where do you go to, um, uh, you know, find the answers? Uh, I'll show you that in, in just a minute. Um, Tim here has a, a question on the chat about the engine ID quiz, okay? Well, Tim, I haven't talked about that yet. And um, 
that quiz is in Canvas, and so it works a little differently than the Briggs and Stratton ones. Um, and because that engine ID quiz is one that's in Canvas, I do have to manually grade it. So, so for this, a lot of the quizzes that are built into Canvas, not the Power Portal, but Canvas, um, I have to go, and if there's anything that's a short answer question, I have to manually go in there and look at that. So Tim, I bet you, you probably got a pretty good score. It just doesn't look like a good score right now because I have to go in there and manually add up some points. So fear not on, on that stuff, okay? All right. Um, okay, so uh, we're back to Briggs and Stratton though, guys. Where do I go to figure out, well, what are the right answers according to Briggs and Stratton? Well, there is a Briggs and Stratton book that is recommended for this class. Um, and I'll, I'll punch that up on a, a different tab, but there's also a bunch of videos. So I'm gonna hit power channel here and I'm gonna go to courses. Now courses is a fancy way to say a bunch of videos. Technical courses. And I'm gonna start with the basic technical courses. And what I would recommend you do is you start with this four stroke cycle theory of operation course. And what it does is it takes you through some video clips and we'll play a few minutes of this first one. The small four stroke engine has been the backbone of Briggs and Stratton for more than 110 years during this time. So you got a little bit of a Briggs commercial, but you know, it is pretty cool to see how they're built, designed and made and that type of thing. Um, but they have some pretty cool animations. Like here, they're looking at the valves and I got a, an overhead valve designed engine. Let me turn the volume back up. That lets the engine operate and maintain longevity. First, we will discuss the two types of engines Briggs makes, single cylinder and V-twins. Then we will identify the differences between them, vertical and horizontal. Okay, so what I would recommend you do is watch the video clips. In fact, what you might even need to do is really watch not only this video clip, but watch a couple video clips ahead. Um, so four cycle theory, there's gonna be some overlap between that and compression. So watch, watch both of those uh, uh, videos as you go through there, okay? Um, and sometimes the sections are broke down into multiple video segments. So here we got compression, we got piston rings, valves, like, like it's broken down into a whole bunch of sub videos, if you will. So you go on a Bridge and Stratton, you watch the videos. Um, sometimes it might help you to look at a service manual. And again, you can go back to where those manuals are and look at like an overhead valve, single cylinder manual. Um, and then uh, there is um, a book for this course. It's Google searching it. Hey, there it is. So, um, and this should have been, you know, in the bookstore website. Um, what I will say is you don't need the latest one. See this Bruce Radcliffe guy, he actually uh, has worked for Briggs and Stratton for a bunch of years. Really, really smart guy. Here's the ISBN number. Like this exactly matches Briggs and Stratton's curriculum. This is like their factory uh, training uh, technician uh, training manual. Um, so some of those test questions would exactly line up with this book. So do I recommend you get it? By all means, like it would definitely help you learn more about small engines. Um, but you guys as an individual have to pick, you know, figure out, well, can I afford to get the book? Do I, do I need it? That type of thing. There's a ton of good information in there. Even if you bought an older one, an older edition, that would work. What's in the newer edition is fuel injection systems. And of course, some of the latest technology advancement that Briggs and Stratton has. Um, but an old, you know, an older edition would still work for a lot of the information in our class because we don't really go too deep into fuel injection. So this is the fourth edition. If you found like a third edition, that that's going to work with what 
we're doing in, in, in our class, okay? So I do recommend getting one of those, maybe get a, get a used one, something like that. Um, you know, you get through our bookstore, you probably Amazon it. There's the ISBN number. That's the important number to know when you're looking for books, right? But it's ATP Publishers. You can see the Briggs and Stratton logo right, right here on it. Um, that's the, the factory book from, from Briggs, okay? So as far as these, these tests online for Briggs and Stratton, what I, I've had lots of students not buy this book and they're still able to pass the tests with over 75% and get it figured out between the materials that I have in class and the videos and stuff that are online. You know, I've had, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of students get by without getting the book. But I will definitely say that if you want to know, you know, all that you can know about small engines, right? If you want to be really, really smart in this area, then this will be a great book to get. And it will definitely help you learn more information and it will make answering those questions on the Briggs and Stratton Power Portal, it'll make that um, easier uh, for you to do, okay? So if I go back to that um, Power Portal test and I go to, courses and then I I end up you know getting in here and I want to um, do the basic certifications you know there's going to be some questions that are pretty technical um, and Briggs doesn't make it easy they they like hey they want you to they want you to learn the information so they don't tell you exactly they tell you what kind of general area you missed they don't tell you exactly which one you missed so um, anyways that's how Briggs and Stratton testing works um, what I find as far as these tests go, uh, usually people get through the four cycle one fairly easy. The compression one, not too bad. The ignition one, not too bad. It's the fuel systems and the governors that tend to give folks the most struggle. Okay. Um, and so we'll, we'll spend a lot of time in this class on those two areas specifically, we're gonna spend a lot of time on carburetors. Once we get through engines and you guys, I feel like you guys know how an engine works, man, this is this is the bulk of our time right here. Why? Because I would say easily 70% of your small engine issues are gonna be related to fuel delivery issues, carburation issues, okay? Um, and so we'll, we'll spend a lot of time on that area. All right. So with that, you've seen the power portal. Uh, you know that we are in the process of working on getting still up and running again for you guys. So just hang tight on that. You know, I'll, I'll get it going. Uh, you, you'll see a class announcement coming up when I get this figured out. I'm still waiting for still to get back to me and say, well, okay, we found your stuff. Here it is, that type of thing. Um, uh, and that should happen any day. So you'll see an announcement on that. You've seen Briggs and Stratton. Let, we've learned a little bit about how engines work. What we didn't do today is go into, um, and I brought up, uh, and I brought a bunch of tools and stuff up here with me. We didn't go into tools and stuff, um, but I'll tell you what we'll do is, is, is next week, our hot topics for class is gonna be hand tools and shop, shop safety stuff. Um, and items of that uh, of that nature, so that you guys can, um, uh, you know, uh, get to work on maybe some some projects at home. We'll also talk about the Briggs and Stratton uh, model type and code ID numbers and the ID number um, uh, activity. And I'll make sure if I need to adjust due dates on stuff, I'll look at that and get those dates adjusted. Um, I always want to have talked about something before it's due, right? So I talked about it on a Wednesday. I'll usually get that uh, video posted to YouTube by Thursday, let's say. People got a, a little bit of time to review that stuff before it's due. Speaking of YouTube, as we kind of wind things up, um, I did have some links in our Canvas page, if I can find that site again because i've had so many different tabs cruising around here nope let's see there it is nope that's free stretch power portal 
There it is. Um, so I've had some um, uh, links here on announcements and stuff. And I'll put something on the home page as well, because what I did last year, and I'll be adding to it this year, is put together a um, uh, a playlist on YouTube of different class videos for you guys, right? So I have a little intro video. Um, I'm obviously going to have to redo my still training demonstration because it's a whole new website, right? Put a little power portal deal. The SP2 safety test, we'll be talking about that more next week. Um, and uh, and then you, you can see all my class sessions from last year as well. Um, so I'll, I'll leave those up there. Our class sessions this year will be similar. They might go in a little bit different order. I might have some different tech tips and stuff, but you have lots of resources there. So if you go in there, uh, go to YouTube and you search up uh, Mr. French, um, you should be able to find my my channel and I should have a, a playlist of all these uh, small injury repair course videos, uh, 16 videos that will help you guys as you navigate this this course. OK, so you've seen. You've seen the website. Now you've seen the kind of YouTube, the support videos that I've made. We've done a pretty good tour of the power portal today we've talked about some basic engine parts and the four stroke cycle um and hopefully you're you're seeing that you know how the syllabus is set up everything is set up to the modules and we're running through those five modules that line up with the power portal stuff with basics compression fuel systems governors and then ultimately um, ignition and electrical. Um, you also have some other tabs here where you can see like what assignments are due and what's coming up. Um, and there's a couple different ways to do this. So let me go back to our home screen as we just round things up. One of the things I like to look at here as a student when I'm taking a Canvas class is I like to go right here and I look, like to look at this uh, to-do list. Oh, there's a whole bunch of um, announcements and stuff that I've missed here. And there's a getting to know you discussion thing that I didn't do on my student login here. So, so that's like your to-do list is like, oh, this is the stuff I'm supposed to do. I need to look at these things, right? So I always recommend checking that out. The other way you can go about this uh, class or probably any of your Cam Canvas classes for that matter is to go over here to the course calendar and see what is due when. So here's that getting to know you and I've been kind of reading those. I'm going to start posting some replies. And then um, we got some stuff with the course waiver and um, what are your projects and gosh, I should have talked more about this stuff. Um, and obviously I'm going to have to move some stuff around here. So, um, but this shows you what to do. And like I said, you know what? It's fluid. We have the technology to fix some stuff. So like still, still's not working, right? So we're going to go in here and I, I'm going to, I'm going to fix this thing right now. Cause I want you guys to know that, you know, it's not like stuff is set in stone as every, every online class I've done, there's always some type of weird issue, technical glitch, especially when you're relying on other websites for information. Um, so we'll get that stuff dialed in. Fear not, if you're having a problem with something, if something's not working right, we'll go in there and fix that. I'm gonna leave my student view right here. I'm gonna go to assignments. We'll look at that still one. Um, and what we're gonna do is fix him now. I can fix the due date pretty easily. I can't fix all the screenshots that that easy. So we'll move him back uh, for a week. I will move him back for more than a week, uh, about a week from the day. Um, and we'll get rid of this. So it doesn't lock out or anything, save. 
going to still take me some while to update some of these screenshots because the the dashboard's going to look different. You can see that the website there was different back then. Um, anyways, uh, so we'll get stuff moved around. Now, if I go back to my home screen and I go back to my student view, and it's thinking about it, it's loading, guys. Um, then I go to my calendar. Now you'll see that this assignment has moved, right? So the um, the things I would like you to do is there's a course waiver for every uh, ARC uh, auto course or small engine course. I like you guys to get that course waiver submitted. Let's see if that link works properly. Looks like it is. So you want to download the link to your computer, then you can fill it out. It's a fillable form. Then save it once you know you downloaded your computer save it, then edit it, then save it again, then load it back up to Canvas. Um, we'll move this one back as well, this four cycle theory. We've talked about it again today though. So now you, I feel like we've covered that pretty good, um, but we'll get that guy moved back. And the other thing I like to know is like, well, what projects do you have? Start thinking about what projects do I wanna work on in class, okay? All right, so we'll get those due dates and stuff moved around on that, uh, fear or not, so you guys can get that stuff in. Um, so I want to know a little bit more about you. I want you guys to pick out some projects. And um, and then if you don't have a project, contact me and we'll, we'll get you a project. Um, and then uh, we'll get you, you know, go in the right direction on some of these engine certifications. Okay. All right, so with that, we'll go back to our... Um, our home screen and I just want to give you guys an, an opportunity to uh, ask any questions or anything you can put those questions on the chat or you could just um, you know shout them out so to speak uh, you know there's um, we've gone a little longer than I really wanted to go right because I know like you, if you're on zoom for more than an hour you, you start you start fading out um, but we got to talk about engines I got to show you some stuff Again, we have those YouTube videos you could look at to also get you going as well. Next week, we'll come in. We'll be talking about tools. We'll be talking about shop safety. Um, and we'll be talking about engine model type code ID numbers and, and just kind of keep moving things forward from there. Okay. All right. With that, any, any, last, uh, any last questions, guys? Okay. Well, keep your, uh, you know, Keep looking at Canvas. You'll see some updates here uh, over the next couple of days. We'll get those due dates moved. I'm going to put a link on our home screen here for that YouTube channel. So that's easy for you to find. Um, and obviously, I got to get all the still stuff fixed. Uh, and uh, so, so you know, this, this class will keep kind of like your engines at home. As you work on it, it's going to keep getting fine-tuned. This class is going to keep getting fine-tuned as we, as we go through it. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for being with me this morning. Uh, I appreciate it. I hope to see you guys or at least see your black little squares on Zoom uh, next week. And uh, we'll go from there. Uh, and again, we'll, you'll see lots of updates coming up on our site. It's going to be a great summer semester. You guys will get this class out of your way and hopefully get some uh, small engine projects that you have around your house run a little bit better this semester. Thanks, right. Professor. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right. We will um, we will catch you guys later. Okay. You guys all take care. I'll say I'll say goodbye for now. And Thanks. thank you guys. All right. Bye.